review of the uh, minutes and uh, and letters. Give everybody a minute. If we're ready for a motion or a uh, question. I've got a minor edit. This is uh, purely out of vanity. I think on page three, uh, my name needs to be uh, spelled <laughs> correctly. I'll make a motion to spell his name correctly. My, my, fir <laughs> my first, my first uh, motion of the day is all about vanity. So. Apparently, people in the back can't hear us. I don't know who's in, ever in charge of the audio, if you could help us out. We're working on that. <laughs> So, so with that correction, do we have a motion to approve um, the uh, minutes and the letters? I so move. We have a second. Oh, we'll second it. We've got a, a motion and a second. So put it up for a vote. All those in favor of approval of the minutes and the letters, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'm saying none. agenda. Do we have anything before the first case? I believe we had something on the agenda. Michael, did you want to present something before we hear the first case? Oh, there you go. Thank you. So um, every year, our permit, we have an MS4 permit with TDEC. And um, I'm Josh Hayes, by the way. I work for Michael Hunt in the uh, stormwater MPDS section. And we oversee our MS4 permit compliance. And uh, we do a lot of activities. Uh, regulate development is one of the activities that we do, but we do a lot of other activities per our permit with TDEC. And every year, we have to do an annual report and submit all of our data to TDEC. Um, and as part, part of the permit, they require us to become, come before a body and present a summary of our permit compliance activities for the, the previous year. Uh, so that's why we're here today. This will be very brief and quick. Um, but we'll scroll through as we go down. The annual report uh, is for the fiscal year. It's actually due uh, six months after the fiscal year. Um, so we submitted it to TDEC last year. I mean, last month, and uh, it's up on the website. The link at the bottom of that page will actually take you to the report. Uh, the report itself is almost 200 pages of, of document uh, with data, tables, and all kinds of stats that we have to submit to TDEC. So what I've done is I just pulled out some of the highlights, and we'll go through real quick. And if you have any questions at the end, I'm sure my, I can answer them, or Michael will be able to help answer them. Um, but I don't know if you can see some of the pictures there, if it's possible to zoom in. Uh, each year, uh, we highlight some of the uh, things that we find in, in our permit, uh, because first of all, the, the MS4 permit, the whole reason for it is to stop pollution into our streams. Um, so this body's here to regulate development, to pre prevent impacts to streams from development, but we also have a program in place to regulate other sources of pollution, such as sanitary sewer, overflows to creeks, uh, people dumping things uh, into uh, storm drains, ditches, and creeks. Um, so each year we get uh, citizen complaints. We find things on our own. Uh, we even get complaints from the EPA that citizens send in and TDEC. This one here pictured is actually one that we received from TDEC about uh, an overflow from a gas station, a sanitary sewer. And we went out there, and um, the cleanout cap from the, the gas station was overflowing into a wooded area behind the facility. It looked like it had been going on for several months, going down a hill. Fortunately, it was not going straight into a stream, uh, but it was going into a floodplain area and uh, uh, created a bad situation. So when it would rain, you'd obviously have increased nutrients and bacteria running off into the streams. So we uh, got with the, uh, the uh, commercial gas station 
issued them a notice of non-compliance, asking them nicely. We always try our, to be nice at first, um, trying to get them to repair their clean out so that we can end this source of pollution to the, the floodplain. And uh, they, they did not respond to our requests and never fixed it. We went back out several weeks later, same condition. Um, so we had to elevate it to an enforcement. We don't like to enforce, it's not our goal. Our goal would be zero enforcement if we could ever get there, because that means there's no pollution. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to enforce in some cases, and we, we do, and, and our enforcement has uh, administrative penalties associated with it. Um, so we did that, and it was fixed uh, very quickly after that. And all the sanitary sewer material was clean. So if we can scroll to the next one. And this one relates to more of what this body does, overseeing construction and development. Uh, we we uh, have a group over in the MPDS office that inspects all the sites that get approved, that get the grading permits. And um, in this case, you guys are probably familiar with this. This was a site that is right off of Interstate 24 in Antioch, where a site started clearing the floodplain off of Mill Creek. As you all know, Mill Creek's a very important creek that has an endangered crayfish. Um, they didn't have any controls in place, like silt fence uh, or anything else to prevent the sediment from draining right to the creek. We found this as our inspector from another area was driving on the interstate, and he saw it, and he alerted the inspector for that area. And we went out there, immediately issued a stop work order and notice a violation. And this one actually had an accompanying, I think it was a $1,400 penalty associated with it. Um, and they had to come before this body to establish a buffer restoration plan and floodplain restoration plan, which is still, as I understand it, uh, being worked through. Um, so those are just two examples. I could have put 20 or 40 examples, but for the sake of time, this is just two examples of what we deal with from our program and trying to stop pollution to our creeks. Um, so the next page, I just pulled some of the more important stats out of the annual report. Um, now, one thing I want to say is the permit is for all of Metro. It's not just the stormwater MPDS office. It's for all of, all of Metro. We just happen to be the department that oversees the compliance activities to make sure that we're doing the compliance. A lot of the compliance activities we rely on other departments to do, uh, such as the first item here, the street sweeping. This is a permit requirement, and it's a very important permit requirement. If you think about it, all the dirt and grime that's from tires and everything else that's on the streets, uh, when you have curb and gutter, when, that, when it rains, all that's washing into these storm drains, and in most cases, it goes straight to streams or ditches that feed streams. Uh, so anything that we can do as a program to be out there and sweep in the streets, that's a direct uplift to what's running off when it storms. Uh, so we're very proud of this program. It's overseen by our maintenance division under Ricky Swift and Casey Cooper, and we contract it all out. Um, but last year alone, we track what we do. We swept over 21,000 miles of urban streets, and in that sweeping, because we take it to the dump and we get dump tickets, uh, we collected over uh, 5,900 tons of debris that otherwise would have ended up in the, in the storm gutters, drains and eventually in our creeks. So it's a very important program. Uh, stormwater maintenance, we also have our routine maintenance section that we have over 40 individuals out working every day, even today in this cold weather, they're out there working. And um, we're, they're cleaning out inlets and ditches every day. Last year alone, we cleaned out over 189,000 cubic yards of material from drainage ditches and culverts. Um, and we also cleaned out over 15,000 inlets and catch basins. Um, much of that material would have ended up in streams if we didn't clean it out. But it also helps to obviously prevent flooding in our, our streets and make them safe. Um, so they do tremendous work and we're very proud of what they do. Um, we also, when we clean out a ditch, we don't just leave it bare. We go back with erosion control matting so that it does not erode and we don't create another source of sediment draining to our creeks. So last year alone, we you know, installed over 190,000 square feet of erosion control matting, uh, which is very important to what we do as maintenance. Our development review services under HAL, uh, we 
you know, with the development boom that Nashville's undergoing, they do a tremendous amount of work. Last year alone, they approved over 14,000, I mean 1,400 plans, uh, which include, includes grading permit, approvals, uh, as built, and uh, other types of sign-offs. Uh, so very proud of what they do, and they do a tremendous amount of work. Um, our inspectors over under Michael and Dell Binder at our office, they're out there every day. On average, each inspector has uh, about 120 sites that they have to look at, uh, and they inspect them once a month at a minimum. Um, so they do a lot of work. And uh, they look at not just the erosion control structures, but they look at the infrastructure. Is everything grouted? Everything installed correctly? So a tremendous amount of work. And um, I think, it, is it seven inspectors that we have, Michael? So at any given time, we got over 800 grading permits that are active that they're inspecting. Um, we ha and we add to that every, every day or every week uh, as the development services is approving plans that comes to our department and we have to do pre-construction meetings. Last year we had to do over 297 uh, pre-construction meetings uh, for new sites getting new grading permits. Um, and another eight last year alone we signed off sites that were permitted in previous years over 203 grading permit sites were signed off. And then that kicks it over to another section that has to inspect the controls that were put in place, like detention ponds, bioretention basins, and all the other structures to manage the stormwater after construction. Um, last year alone, Dale Binder's section did over 6,700 inspections. That includes erosion control inspections and looking at infrastructure. Um, Kimberly, she's over here over the single family section. Um, they did over 2,600 inspections. As you know, we have a different permit system for small single family development. So that's very, that's booming as well. And they're very busy. And then as far as the next section um, deals with our watershed, our permit group, uh, which is a group that I manage, we respond to complaints like the, the this photographs that I showed you earlier with the sanitary sewer overflows, people dumping chemicals in storm drains. We responded to over 107 investigations last year, many of which don't turn out to be anything, but you know, I'd estimate about 30 or 40 of them. We have to go back numerous times because they did turn out to be something that we had to follow up with, make a site do something, and go back and make sure they, they did correct the action. Um, and on top of that, everybody knows how Nashville's traffic is, and it's getting worse every year. Our spill numbers keep going up pretty much every year. Uh, they used to be, when I first started in 2003, we'd go out on maybe 10 spills a year where there's a major wreck on an interstate. We only go out on the major ones. Public Works and TDOT handles the, the minor ones. But when we go out, it's usually pretty major. Tanker truck, a big saddle tank, 50 gallons of diesel fuel. Uh, last year we went out on 39 spill responses. So as the traffic increases, Nashville the development increases, that's not going to increase as well. Uh, sanitary sewer overflow investigations, we're always busy with that. We Again, like the spill response, we only go out if we're requested. If it's a major overflow that did get into a creek, um, that we need to go out and assess the conditions of the creek, monitor that creek. Uh, work with TDEC on the appropriate cleanup for that creek. Last year we did 16 responses of that. And with the, Hal and I were just talking, with the cold weather, when, as it starts warming up, we're anticipating some more main breaks, and we're going to be involved with that as well. Um, so we also have our health department. We, believe it or not, there's still quite a bit of this, uh, area within Davidson County that has septic tanks, and our health department oversees that. And last year alone, they, they issued uh, 24 notices to sites that had failing septic tanks, uh, which if anybody's ever been around an area with septic tanks, you'll know when it's failing. Uh, you can smell it. And all that bacteria, all that those nutrients are just draining right off into the stream. So it is, it is a very important activity that they follow up with those sites. Our section um, actually is, uh, screened, dry weather screened out Foster Creeks, over 337 last year, looking for illicit discharges in dry weather. Um, our enforcement actions, uh, we issued over 
109 uh, notices of violations to construction sites. Now, as I mentioned, we'd love for that to be zero. And we're, we, we'd love to see that con continue to trend down. That means that people are complying with our regulations and we don't have to be out there holding their feet to the fire. But unfortunately, a lot of times they don't and we have to have an enforcement uh, provision within our program. And so we issued over 109 violations to sites that included 39 stop work orders for development sites where we went out there and posted a stop work order, which gets the, the main intention of a site because that's money that they're losing every day. Um, 11 notice of violations specific for non-construction illicit discharges where people might have dumped paint or other materials that weren't related to a construction site. Um, we issued 39 notices of non-compliance. We just started really beefing up our section with the, that's in the permit group that oversees and inspects these controls after they're built. After they're signed off, Dell's inspectors are done, and then it's turned over to our section, and we go out and we deal with the property owner that's followed up with the deed of that property that has to maintain that buyer attention or that detention pond or that water quality vault that has to do that maintenance and reporting. We've, we're starting to beef up that section. Uh, towards the end of last year, we hired two inspectors where previously we only had one person that was doing everything. And uh, so we got two people dedicated to inspecting these structures, going around the county, making sure they're being maintained. We're looking to uh, beef that up to four next uh, fiscal year. So we'll have four people going around the entire county inspecting these sites. So 39 notices of uh, non-compliance being sent to owners that they're not maintaining. Next year, this will be a lot more. Um, so we, this is a main focus of our program going forward because if a site builds a buyer attention, a detention pond, and they're not maintaining it, it's just bypassing. And that means we allowed that site to develop and it's not being treated for the, the post-construction runoff. So we are gonna focus a lot of attention in that area. Um, last year alone, the construction violations, uh, we, we do penalize, we uh, send out administrative penalties with all of our violations. It was over $44,000. Um, and then the non-construction was right at 2,000. We also have a section we call the watershed group that does all the monitoring of creeks. They're out there every day taking samples, walking creeks, it's under Mary Bruce. And last year alone, they collected over 462 samples of the creeks, and they did visual stream assessments of over 23 miles. And that's just not walking a stream and just noting how the stream looks. They have to fill out every 1,000 feet. They have to fill out a form, take measurements, photographs, and document the conditions of that creek. So that's a lot of work. Um, and then finally, but probably most important is our public education because as we go forward, we know uh, making people understand the connection to their activity and how it impacts water and the creeks that they love to recreate in is very important. So we spend a lot of time every year expanding our public education program. Um, we work with uh, our public information office under Sonia Allman, and uh, there's a new person there, Jen Harmon, and Julie Berbiglia. Um, and then in our office, we have Elizabeth Wilson that kind of heads this up. But last year alone, um, Julie Berbiglia did uh, 574 programs with schools where she goes around to every school, fifth and fourth grade. She tries to hit almost every classroom where she does a water education program, trying to educate students about the water cycle, how, uh, what their activities they do, how it can impact stormwater runoff, creeks that they recreate in, and then ultimately the drinking water that we get our, our drinking water from the Cumberland River. Um, so that's, that, um, means that over 13,000 students were reached last year alone. So it's a very important program. Uh, I'll sk skip some of the other stuff, but one of the things I wanted to highlight is we just started last year uh, with a nonprofit, working with them, getting them our drains that we have mapped, and we started an adopt a drain program to try to encourage businesses, residents that have drains in their parking lots to take care of their, their storm drains. And we feel like, uh, Hopefully this will be successful. Um, we worked with them and the first year we had over 350 storm drain adoptions where they go out and they clean out the storm drain before it be becomes an issue. Um, 
And then, of course, we, we hosted the fourth annual Urban Runoff 5K and Water Quality Festival. It's something that we enjoy to do every year that we do in cooperation with our regulator. So those are just some of the highlights, and I am done, unless, Michael, if you have anything. All right. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? May, I would, would add one thing, which is he mentioned the additional emphasis on the stormwater control measures throughout the county. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scope of that, we're approaching 5,000 of those uh, controls in the ground. So, and with all the additional permits that are coming through and being signed off, that number's continuing to grow 30, 40, 50 per month. So it is something that we felt was, there was a definite need to get ahead of and make sure that all of those are being maintained, inspected, and functioning as designed. I just want to add a couple of observations of uh, compliments. One, um, um, I started my career as a young soil conservationist with USDA, so I, I, I'm kind of attentive to, attentive to stream health and, and particularly ditch maintenance. I've noticed that when you all are using your clamshell excavator, you're maintaining nice, clean parabolic channels that are very stable. You come right back in with either uh, straw-based uh, matting or um, coconut fiber matting, depending on how much water's going through the ditch. It gets stabilized right away. The grass seed comes up fast, which keeps sediment debris out of our infrastructure, which clogs infrastructure, which increase, increases flooding if we don't keep that sediment debris out in addition to the sediment that goes into our streams. Right. It's in our streams as well as our pipes if we don't keep that sediment out. Yeah. So you all do a great job of that. And I particularly admire the fact that you're allowing uh, natural drainage ways to infiltrate water within the ditches. Right. We still have some efforts in the community where we're using concrete in the bottom of channels. And I've noticed that uh, debris, rocks, and soil, and, and organic material will pile up on top of that concrete. It's a lot harder to get in there and get that stuff out than it is with the clamshell excavators because you're damaging right. the concrete when you have to scrape it off. Absolutely. And so I, I really applaud Metro Water Services for, for creating natural drainage in the community. Uh, and then secondly, I, I, I revisit the spot that Kimberly and um, um, uh, I think Tom Palco and, and I know uh, uh, yeah, Rebecca, <laughs> I'm, I'm old and I'm drawing a blank right now on names, Rebecca Dome, uh, worked on on Seven Mile Creek about 12, 13 years ago. I know those trees are nice and healthy now along the buffer of Seven Mile Creek, and there are community gardens on the edge of the buffer, you know, where they should be in the less frequently flooded area. And so our floodplains are being used for a variety of purposes now. They're healthy. Yeah, because of Metro Water Services uh, yeah. leadership. So and I know you all do a lot of tree planting every year as well, right, yeah. Michael? So. And probably one of the things I probably should have highlighted is the uh, floodplain buyout program that yeah. Tom oversees. Uh, it's been an enormous benefit. Yeah. Uh, buying out homes, tearing them down that are in the floodplains, right off floodways right off of creeks, and establishing uh, natural habitat riparian habitat back. It's a huge benefit. <coughs> and thank you for the kind words. I'll pass that along to Ricky Swift on the maintenance. We have worked with them and, and they are doing a much better job of stabilizing the ditches as they go forward. And we're actually going to talk to them about, you know, in, in areas that we have a lot of concrete and they're already starting to do it on their larger capital projects, mm -hmm. uh, removing some of that concrete. Because we see the same things. You know, when you have concrete and it transitions t from or to natural earth, you got scouring. There's no way around it. It goes under it, goes and around it, and yeah, it costs taxpayer yeah, and money. All the time they're doing maintenance projects where slabs of concrete wash up or scouring around it. So <laughs> you brought up a good point, and uh, we agree with you on that, and we'll, we'll move forward with that. I think Roger wants to add something. Sure, just to follow up on, on Josh's statement, Metro has now purchased 352 houses going back to the year or two years before the flood, we started acquiring houses then, repetitive loss houses on Wimpole Drive and other places, and, and obviously the great mass of those properties since the flood, and we actively are purchasing to, to demolish houses right now, actually still using money that was left over that was part of the, the FEMA grants that were made available in the post-flood days. We're, we're, we're buying houses actively in Gibson Creek right now to tear down. And it's just astounding to find out that, that as you talk to these people, uh, given the, the, the extent to which 
severe events continue to happen more frequently, um, that people come in and talk to us and they've flooded three and four and five times in the last five and six years. So we've had at least two events uh, this year that constitute you know, greater than 1,000 year recurrence interval events. Um, big events, what we call the remnants of Harvey event the last weekend of, of uh, August and then another event in, in November. Um, these, are, these are freak events that happen over a confined drainage basin that causes a lot of damage and more houses to flood. So um, there will be a new, going forward, we've got approval to start design in a Corps of Engineers project in Mill Creek. Uh, we're targeting another 89 houses in the Mill Creek Basin, Mill Creek and Seven Mile Creek Basin for further additional uh, repetitive loss house removal. So that's a very active continuing program that's being led by, under Tom, led by Stan Robinson and Tony Plummer, who are very experienced house buyers um, uh, and, and do a good job of acquiring those properties for demolition, so. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, thank you, Mr. Hayes. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you for your time. Uh, my understanding is that we wanted to make a quick change to the agenda, a modification to the agenda. Was there something that needed to be read into one of the? It will be read when the cases are introduced. We just wanted to note that it would be a modified uh, agenda from what you have in front of you right okay, now. Okay, sounds good. We'll do it at that point in time. Exactly. Okay. Uh, if that's the case, then we'll go ahead and uh, introduce the first case to be heard. Before we do that, uh, Ms. Gilbert, if we could read into the record the statement for the uh, applicants. Okay, before I read the statement, I think Rebecca wanted to make a update on Fontenelle. Uh, yes, I um, brought it to your attention that Fontenelle would be coming to the, the next Stormwater Management Committee meeting uh, in response to a notice of noncompliance that we issued. Unfortunately, due to the holiday and um, some correspondence between our office and them not um, getting to them in a timely manner, we're now extending it to March for when they can come before you. Okay, thank you for the update. Our opening statement to the applicant. If you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of centuria with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you, Ms. Gilbert. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn to the first case to be heard, and we will turn the mic over to staff for the introduction. Um, the first case is 2017 -00033. BNA Terminal Apron Expansion, located at 1 Terminal Drive, Suite 502. The map is 107, parcel, parcel 50. The NPDES inspector is Donald Erz, and it's Council District 13. The applicant is requesting to allow the following. To encapsulate 627 feet of a tributary to Sims Branch, and 33 feet of another tributary to Sims Branch. To fill in and remove 0.4 acres of a low quality emergent wetland and to waive the water quality requirements and to propose an alternative method. The, ap the appellant is the Metropolitan Nashville Airport Authority represented by Matt Koss with Garver Engineers if the variance is approved, stormwater staff requests that the species diversity is increased so that no species comprises more than 20% of the native trees proposed. And to please ensure that the trees proposed for buffer mitigation will be left in place and not be subjected to the same clearing activities occurring on other portions of airport property. No comments were provided from codes planning defers to stormwater for review, and greenways defers to the stormwater management committee. 
Thank you. I forgot to add, if the applicant want to come up, come on up to the table, it'd be great. And with that introduction, we'll turn the floor over to you. Present your request. Thank you. Um, as staff said, my name is Matt Koss with Garber Engineers. I'm the consulting engineer um, that was primarily responsible for the design of this project. Uh, I've been uh, employed by the um, Metropolitan Nashville Airport Authority, uh, specifically at BNA, to uh, assist them in this venture. Um, about this project, uh, just broad overview, broad strokes, it is one of the enabling projects that's critical to the completion of the larger BNA Vision program that seeks to expand the terminal capacity um, through a number of, of building projects. One of the most critical and involved with, with this, what you see before you today, is the expansion of the international arrivals facility, which will service uh, all future international arrivals at Nashville International. Um, it's a critical piece of, of the overall plan for um, the, the program. The project, uh, as we see it today, is largely a preparation for future apron pavement construction. Uh, such as no actual apron pavement will be built as part of this project. It's going to be primarily the placement of fill. Uh, the current site sits approximately 50 feet below the existing apron pavement. It's basically a, a large hole um, from back when the terminal apron was originally constructed in the late 80s. Uh, at this time, though, due to how the uh, terminal is required to expand for the additional capacity uh, for the safe maneuver of aircraft. We're going to need to fill in that area and pave it such that aircraft can maneuver and um, for other critical um, activities such as de-icing in the future. Unfortunately, as part of that, in order to accomplish that, um, there is a unnamed tributary to Sims Branch, which is located within the project area, as well as two low quality emergent wetlands that have developed as a result of the uh, construction of the connector taxiway, basically just compounding some natural drainage. Um, we are proposing to uh, mitigate both of these. The stream will be mitigated on site, and we're we, are, we are coordinating with TDEC to that end, as well as the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and, of course, Metro itself. Um, the wetlands uh, will be paid into a wetland bank for the mitigation piece, and uh, uh, certainly a little bit cleaner and a little bit uh, better way to go about with the wetland mitigation with respect to it's hard to mitigate that on airport property due to FAA regulations of concern because of safety of bird strikes. The project um, will have a significant amount of fill placement within the buffer area. As such, uh, we are requesting the encapsulation of that unnamed tributary. Uh, a little bit of background on that tributary. Uh, it originates over in the uh, parking area of the airport. Uh, it's all basically storm runoff and some underground spring water. Uh, there's no point source that really you can draw back to this particular tributary. Um, it uh, begins its life in a pipe and then it, it, it also pretty much ends its life where it dumps into Sims Branch in a pipe. The only place where it actually sees the light of day is where it crosses through the project site. So it, it comes out of a 60 inch pipe. Um, enters the project area and flows across the ground, at which point then it goes back into another concrete pipe to get underneath the connector taxiway before it heads to Sims Branch. Um, with regard to the stormwater quality request, um, the stormwater quality request stems from the fact that this uh, project is taking place within the airport environment. And the airport environment, specifically the apron, is just a little bit different than the average uh, project site that you may see in Metro. Uh, the apron pavement that you see out there is probably the cleanest pavement you're ever going to find. Uh, that's due to the nature of having to service the aircraft. Uh, foreign object debris is, is a big focus of, of operations in the airfield. As such, no trash, no debris, no rocks, no pebbles, no grit 
anything is cleaned off of the apron um, because the opportunity to suck that into a jet engine is not only a costly endeavor, it's also a huge safety hazard. Um, so the typical TSS that you would see in, in your normal stormwater runoff um, doesn't necessarily exist uh, in the same capacity that it, uh, on the apron as it, as it does out, out in the general environment. Um, however, there are specific pollutants within the apron that don't exist out in the rest of Mestro. The most important of those being jet fuel and uh, glycol that's used for de-icing aircraft during the winter months. The airport already does have significant facilities to treat the um, glycol used for de-icing as well as a large network of oil water separators and grease traps to service uh, the occasional um, oil or uh, jet fuel spillage. Being that this will be used for de-icing in the future, we are proposing to treat it the same way that the rest of the apron pavement is treated. Um, that would preclude the use of either any LID elements or traditional um, TSS removal units for the stormwater piece. Instead, all the stormwater would be routed to the existing treatment systems, um, which are on property for the treatment of the glycol, uh, as well as oil water separators. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll turn to the public. Is there anyone here to speak in support of or in opposition of this request? Seeing none, I don't believe there are any letters. No. Okay. Uh, with that, we'll turn it over to the committee for discussion. Okay, well, I'll kick us off. Um, so just to get a, a little history on this site, um, it, you said this is a 50-foot depression. So it, w w is that because this is the approximate or, um, elevation of the original topography at the bottom of the depression or what? Okay. So I'm assuming the contours around it were probably constructed based upon the slopes of the fill above yes, it sir. to create a level, uh, okay, place for the planes to, to move level across the ground and safely. Um, and so basically all we have is uh, is a stream that's daylighted right there and, and what remains of the original topography around it that wasn't filled. Yes, okay. sir. All right. And, um, um, you know, it's always important we at least ask the question, was there any way to avoid this particular site that, from your all's perspective, or, or did this just leave you with no other alternatives, given the fact that um, the expansion, expansion of arriving and departing international flights needs this area? Sure. Um, that's certainly something that was considered throughout the vision planning process. Uh, there were many alternatives that were drawn up and looked at as far as both with the building improvements as well as alternatives to the site itself. Uh, unfortunately, due to just the size of the international flights, they're known as wide, wide body aircraft and they have a large footprint and a large operating space is required, um, there is not an option that can accommodate them. And, and to some extent, I, I guess by staying near existing infrastructure and, and the existing terminal, if you're expanding from there rather than, than sprawling out further, this is a way to, to maintain some density at the terminal. Is that a fair yes, assertion? Yes, Okay. Um, well, I, I'll just say this for the benefit of the public and, and myself and the board that, um, you know, it, it's daylighted streams that uh, are receiving sunlight and lots of oxygen are really critical from a water chemistry standpoint uh, because light and oxygen helps to break down contaminants and pollutants that we have to pay to remove from our drinking water system and from nature, uh, which we use and recreate with and enjoy. And, um, and then secondly, um, uh, um, sunlight creates life that will actually consume contaminants. So once we stop, once we start putting streams and pipes, we lose 
um, a free service that's provided that we don't have to pay for to clean that water. And we lose the ecolo ecological opportunities. Um, suffice it to say, this is a really isolated stream um, uh, that, as you said earlier, starts in a pipe and ends in a pipe. Um, and um, airports grow yes, when cities grow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any comments, questions, discussion from the committee? I still have Did a you say I what the mitigation was? The mitigation, um, the, uh, there's going to be on-property stream mitigation, uh, which will take place um, down at the south of the center runway. Um, we've been working with TDEC as well as FAA and USAC to scope that out and get the, get the plans designed. Um, and then the, uh, the wetlands will be mitigated through Wetland Bank. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused. So, so you're just filling this hole right now, right? You're not paving it. That's correct, right? sir. So, uh, if, if we're just filling a hole, and I assume it's going to be grass on top when you're done, what, what do you? What is the surface going to consist of once you're once you've filled this? Once once the fill is all placed, we'll be topping it out with asphalt. So uh, you are paving it. That's that's my question. Th there there will be a temporary asphalt pavement. It will not be the permanent pavement for the aircraft usage. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke to that. Yeah. Okay. So does the in, in the apron and where all the areas that you're talking about de-icing? Does that gravity flow towards this area? Now, it's collected some. I mean, how do you collect that and send it to a treatment facility today? within the apron area itself. In, in the apron area itself, and I'll speak to that, is the apron area itself has area drains. Mm -hmm. Everything sheet flows to the area drains and it's transferred by pipe either to the south or either to the north. Okay. The airport is split in two pieces. That area right there is a, a to, currently today, we do not do any de-icing there because it has no way to go to treatment. Everything would go sheet flow or go down into the bottom of that hole and go straight to the stream. So there is no de-icing in that one area to date. So, so you, you pave it, no, but you'll not be utilizing this area for any de-icing. We will. We will in the future. Yes, sir. In, in the, the future. future. Once we get this thing filled up, get the get the aircraft paving down, we will be using it for de-icing. And so, are you installing something now to intercept that water and take it to a future location? Yes, sir. The piping and all is going in. And that's the alternative to the water quality units that we'd normally put okay. in. We would take that through. This would go out and go through to the south pond, conveyed through piping, goes into the south okay. pond. We have controls on the, on the south pond. If it's contaminated, it goes directly into the south pond for treatment. If it's clean water, the gate closes, the water bypasses, it goes around, travels through 3,000 foot of Kirby Stream before it enters back into Sims Branch again, then it leaves property. Okay, thank you. And I, I forgot to ask, would you all be willing to accept staff's recommendations that were read into the record earlier? Yes, sir. I think that we would. The only thing is, is about to, uh, you know, the never being able to cut the trees. I can't live, say that with 100% certainty. If we were to take a bird strike off the south end of center, the FAA could come in and say, "You got to move, remove these trees now." So, would you be willing to to mitigate that if you did have to cut yes, them? Yes, sir. Like if, if, if if we have to mitigate them, we'll plant trees somewhere else. We'll do something else. Okay. I think that's our primary concern, that mitigation stay available for the <laughs> benefits that we've lost, the ecological we will do. We will do everything that we can yeah. possibly do. Yeah. We're, we're not asking you to make it more unsafe. We just, no, mitigation sir. can be further away if, if necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, I make a motion to uh, approve the request with staff uh, request. We've got a motion and a second. Do we need any discussion? Seeing none, let's put it up for a vote. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, motion passes. 
I, there's one other thing. The, the staff recommendation is the 20 percent, uh, no more than 20 percent. The approved FAA, the approved FAA planning list will not allow for that. There's not enough trees on the approved FAA planning list to meet the first one on this. We can diversify. How, how many trees are on the FAA planning list? Hmm, I think there's 13 or 20. All, all you need are five. So we're asking for, for no more than, or at least five different species to be used. So no one species make up more than 20% of what's proposed. Then we can meet that, we, we can meet you there. Then the motion that's passed works. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move now to the second case to be heard today, which is 2317 Pennington Bend Road. And we'll let the uh, staff read into the record the request. If the applicant wants to go ahead and come on up, that'd be great, thank you. The second case on the agenda is case number 2017-00034-2317 Pennington Bend. The stand part is 06209-006100. The request is for the following, disturbance of the 75-foot floodway buffer, 50-foot zone one and 25-foot zone two of the Cumberland River to construct three single-family houses on three separate parcels to also allow continuous mowing and maintenance of the buffer area. Also, construction and encroachment of minimally disruptive hardscape to provide future dock access. Placement of stream buffer signage in an alternate location. And lastly, placement of stormwater BMPs in the buffer. Thank you very much. If that will turn the um, mic over to the applicant for the presentation. Can everyone hear me? Uh, good morning, thank you for your time and consideration in, uh, in hearing our case. Um, as Kimberly said, uh, we are requesting a, a variance for three separate lots for a single family home on each lot. Um, several variances associated with um, the disturbance that would be contained uh, entirely within the zone two floodway buffer. Um, it's our understanding uh, that the board typically considers four points or, or four criteria uh, in determining the validity of a variance request. Um, the first point being that there is good and sufficient cause. Um, the current property owner, Ms. Ms. Anderson, uh, purchased the property in 1988. Um, if, I don't, I'm not sure if Tom is here today and he may be able to correct me. Um, but it's my understanding that the floodway buffers uh, were not enacted uh, until over a decade later, uh, 1998-99, uh, by the Stormwater Task Force and Management Program Review Committee. Um, at that time, it was a 50-foot buffer. Um, approximately five years later, I believe there was a regulations review committee that then um, brought the floodway buffers into its current format uh, with a zone one and zone two of, of 75 feet. Um, and these floodway buffers that, were, that now encumber the property um, that were of no self-imposed hardship by the current property owner um, essentially rendered the property undevelopable, um, totally encumbering the property with the zone two. Um, I believe in the application, we took into consideration the setback variance uh, that was acquired um, or granted and uh, the lot developable area ranged from somewhere between 190 square feet and maybe 450 square feet in the best case scenario. Um, it's my understanding there's been a lot of debate uh, among the committee and the board as far as um, how lot uniqueness is defined um, in consideration of good and sufficient cause and a, um, and a uh, hardship. And I would just uh, like to ask that the committee um, consider 
how that term is, is applied in this case, and if, if we're talking about, if, is this lot necessarily unique to its um, direct adjacent neighbor in the sense that uh, it's encumbered by floodway, floodplain, and floodway buffer um, that may de be debatable to what impact uh, each property is, is, is impacted. Um, but if you're considering, uh, for instance, the lots directly across the river, um, or even the lots directly across Pennington Bend Road, um, I think these lots are very unique um, when compared to those properties and how they are impacted by the floodway, floodplain, and floodway buffer. Um, before I forget, I do just want to reiterate um, that the applicant has worked to, uh, along with the setback variance, to try to provide the minimum amount of disturbance possible. Um, having the footprint of the house uh, reside entirely uh, outside of the floodplain, um, outside of the zone one buffer, and solely in the zone two buffer. Um, the second criteria I, I believe that is considered in, in considering a variance is no increase in flood heights. Um, those facts that were just presented um, would uh, would lend itself that we would not we won't be increasing flood heights in, in the area. Um, we feel through our mitigation and landscape plan, um, currently I think there's some pictures within the package. Um, you'll be able to see there's really not much in the way of uh, vegetation existing currently on the property. Um, primarily grass, some uh, scrub brush overgrowth. Um, there are two existing trees which we plan to keep. Um, we are also planning on planting six new trees um, along with 85 different shrubs and grasses um, to provide a properly vegetated uh, zone one buffer to the extent possible. Um, our first plan when we met with the, at the pre-application meeting with staff, um, we had the zone one buffer vegetated all the way up to the house. Um, not that we all agreed, but we all kind of discussed that that wasn't really practical. Um, and that 12 feet is kind of the separation that we felt was necessary um, to allow mow and maintenance in the zone one buffer um, while still vegetating the zone one buffer to the fullest extent possible. Um, as I said, um, you know, the third criteria uh, being that there's an exceptional hardship. Um, as, as I mentioned, the enacted regulations for the floodway buffer rendered this property undevelopable. Um, it, while I understand, too, that the Board of Zoning Appeals and this board are entirely independent, um, I do feel like that it's, it's worth noting that that board, um, at least in some capacity, felt that there was a hardship or a unique circumstance for this property um, in their decision to grant the setback variance um, to allow the houses to move closer to Pennington Bend Road. Um, due to floodway buffer encroachment along the house. Um, and the fourth criteria, um, as I understand, is that the applicant has done the minimum necessary to afford relief. Um, as I mentioned, setback variance was, was um, acquired to move 10 feet closer to the house. Uh, I have not been part of these discussions, but it's my understanding that the applicant um, has engaged Metro in some capacity um, discussing a buyout option program. Um, while we understand that, you know, financial is not a hardship, um, the applicant did purchase the property as it was stated in 1988 for a purchase price of $57,000 or $58,000. I believe the buyout that was offered was $9,000 for each lot, which was $27,000 um, nearly uh, almost 20 years later. Um, and the third thing that was done um, to try to provide the minimum necessary relief is to modify the house and building plan slightly such that uh, there, were, there was no structural encroachment uh, within the floodplain or within the zone one buffer. Um, so all those steps were taken uh, to try to mitigate this issue as best as possible um, to provide the bare minimum that was necessary to, to have the lot be buildable or developable. Um, I'd like Mrs. Anderson just to speak a little bit, if that's okay, with the committee, um, just as far as how she acquired the property, what was her vision for the property, 
and kind of where we are today. And then I don't know if I need to reserve time um, to rebut any possible opposition, if that's necessary, or if that's just something that w is granted prior to opposition. But I'd like to do that if that's if that's possible. We'll give you time, and certainly the okay. owner, the owner of the property can speak. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carol Anderson, and I live in the 37214 zip code, one of the best in the nation, I'm sure. And I have most of my life. And back in 1988, I was working two jobs. I was singing back up for Roy Clark and writing country songs for chapel music. And I had a dream that someday I could build my dream house down at the river, which I loved going down. We'd have family picnics there and enjoy the beautiful part of the river that it's on. Well, through the years, the music business has changed, as you've all heard. And I'm now getting checks sometimes for one penny for uh, royalties. <laughs> and uh, I, I never saw that coming. I used to get regular royalties. and so. Um, after 30 years of paying the property tax and trying to maintain the property as best as I could, I made some improvements on it, but the past year or so, I haven't uh, really been able to keep it up like it should, and I need to let it go to somebody who's going to turn it into a beautiful property again. And um, I'm not asking for any favors. I'm just asking for fairness. I know others have gotten variances and have been able to build, and I'm just asking for fairness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with the presentation from the applicant complete, and we'll give you again time to respond <coughs> to stuff, we're going to open up the floor to the public. Uh, I, first, let's do this. There have been a number of letters that were written uh, and provided to the committee, uh, and they were provided to all of the committee members in our applications. We don't have time to read them onto the record, but we are going to read uh, the names of who sent the letters and the address of those people into the record. So first, let's do the list of people that sent letters uh, in support of the uh, request. Okay, we've received letters in support from Jim Anderson of 2219 Pennington Bend Road, Carol Anderson of 536 Rivercrest Cove, Mary O'Neill of 2219 Pennington Bend Road, John Gleaves, who is a member of Miami Land LLC, Mary Frances Rudy, who is also a member of Miami Land LLC, Laura Mitchell, a member of Miami Land LLC. Pam and Tony Adams of 2205 and 2203 Pennington Bend. And Dave Dunn of 2207 Pennington Bend. I'm not sure. Did you mention Mary Frances Rudy of Miami Land LLC? I'm not sure if that made it into the record. If not, I want to go ahead and repeat it. Yes, I did. Oh, okay, okay. Went out of order. Okay, and then those in opposition. Were there some letters in opposition? Okay, and the uh, letters that I received in opposition were from Travis Laura of 2315 Pennington Bend, <coughs> Jeff Syracuse, council member of District 15, and Richard Laurel, who's a member of Pennington Bend Neighborhoods Association. Thank you very much, Ms. Gilbert. And we, again, wanted to do that just to make sure that everybody recognizes that we did receive those letters uh, and they weren't unnoticed. Uh, with that, though, any of these people are still welcome to speak uh, now here in just a moment. So if we could, uh, if there's anyone to speak here first in support uh, of the requested variance, uh, please come forward. And please remember to state your name and address uh, first and foremost when you, meet, when you open the mic. Over here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You should know this by now. <laughs> you should know me by now. Um, I'm Mary O'Neill. I do live at 22. Thank you. I'm, I'm kind of loud anyway. Uh, I live at 2219 Pennington Bend Road. And um, I'm very fond of this neighborhood. I also have great respect for the river and that area down there. But I am definitely for this variance. Since uh, that street is a really little kind of well-kept secret, 
but it could use a shot in the arm. There are several houses down there that look like they've either been abandoned or they could actually be condemned. Um, I feel like to do single family dwellings on single lots is a real attribute for us. There have been two new builds on this street that in my opinion are quite attractive and uh, one has sold quickly, but Nashville is a booming town. Enfield is big. I think this is very tame, for which I personally am grateful, but I think it would only help our neighborhood. Um, and I really feel like that it, it's almost entitlement when people are against this, because I think that such precautions are being taken to have flood venting to build high enough out of the flood way. And I also feel like that property on the river is very rare. It's hard to come by and it's sought after. And I think it's a benefit to make these properties nice. And I just think it's very helpful. Um, I would like to see it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else here to, uh, to speak in support of the uh, requested variance? Seeing none, uh, is anyone here to speak in opposition of the requested variance? Please welcome, come, come on up, thank you. Again, please state your name and your address when you reach the mic and... Um, Hi, my name is Travis Lawler. I'm at 2315 Pennington Bend Road. Um, I'd like to send you a letter um, there are a number of reasons I think you should deny this variance, including the fact that the properties in question are next door to properties the city spent thousands of dollars purchasing after the flood to tear down the damaged homes and create permanent green space. I think granting exceptions so that a developer can build new homes next door to that at much greater density would undermine the previous flood control efforts. As staff mentioned at the September meeting where you denied a similar variance for a property just on the other side of these buyout lots, uh, allowing a check development within the floodway buffers could affect the city's standing with FEMA. But I think the main reason to deny these variances is, be is because the hardship faced by these properties is not unique to them. It's a general characteristic of the area where nearly every property on the river facing, facing portion of Pennington Bend and neighboring Miami is sandwiched between the street and the river with little room for building. And I might mention that they have three lots, 50 feet each, which is the same as where my house is next door, uh, one house on 150 feet. They want to build three houses, which they can do, but if they were to build one house, they might be able to actually do it without having to uh, ask for a variance. Um, so when a court interprets a law or regulation, one of the assumptions they make is that every word in that law or regulation has meaning. And at an earlier Board of Zoning Appeals meeting for these same properties, the developer's attorney argued, in essence, that no two properties are exactly alike. Therefore, every property has a unique hardship. But that cannot be what the regulation means, or else it would have no meaning. So you have to determine at what point a hardship becomes a general characteristic of the area. If it's common to two properties, do they still qualify for variance? An argument could be made for that, I think, but in this case, the answer is obvious. Stormwater staff has identified at least 43 properties with similar hardships. There is a genuine hardship, but it's not one. It's one that needs a collective legislative fix, not a piecemeal granting of variances. Um, our councilman, Jeff Syracuse, who will speak, is aware of the issues and he's working on solutions, and I would urge you to let him continue his work and deny this variance. Um, I also wanted, I, I don't know why they kept saying that this was not in the floodplain. I think y'all know that is in the floodplain. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention that, um, I, I know Ms. Anderson did purchase this in the 1980s and there have been a lot of changes to the development since then, but they weren't made in secret. I mean, so it's not as if she didn't have an opportunity to know what was happening and take action. So thank you very much. Thank you. Typically, we'll let the councilman speak first. There's not a councilman here. Are there council ladies? Oh. Okay. And the next person in opposition. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Jeff wanted me to go first. My name is Richard Lawler. I live at 20, 
313 Pennington Bend Road. I've been there on Pennington Bend for 50 years. Uh, for all that time, I've been the head of the Pennington Bend Neighbors Association, which is not a dictator. I'm just the guy that gets out the news. Um, what we've got here is an, an attempt to put three houses on an R15 lot that's big enough for one house. But to do that, you have to uh, ask for the infill rules. So if you grant that those are valid in the floodplain, there are at least 40 undeveloped properties on Pennington Bend in Miami that would be glad to know that because all those people have been prevented from building on their lots since the flood, since the new rules came in and the new floodway buffers were set up. We went through this argument extensively in September and August. Actually, we started in August when the young couple from out of town came in and bought the property just up the street from this and found out to their dismay that they could not build on it. And the reason uh, was gone through hour after hour in this committee. And at the end, it was decided, despite the fact that we all felt sympathy for them, that that was an improper thing to do, to make those exceptions, to let them build closer to the road than the average of the three houses around them, and to let them build into the floodway buffer. And to pretend that that's not well known here would be ludicrous because Mr. Epstein and his real estate agent, Ms. O'Neill, you just heard from, who stands to make quite a bit of money if these houses are built. She sold the house at 2207 Pennington Bend, and I believe the sale price was in the neighborhood of $600,000, so it's a pretty good commission. So I'm saying that the people you've got letters from are mostly those who plan benefit if you open up the floodplain to the infill regulations. So I think that's the basic point, and I've said all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilman, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, uh, Jeff Syracuse, 15th District. Um, I'm here just being consistent with uh, past uh, issues along Pennington Bend and just asking that you deny uh, variance requests to do any sort of development in, in floodway buffers. Uh, this is rather a, a dense development proposal. And uh, as uh, Travis did mention, that uh, we are working towards, we've made a, a presentation to neighbors uh, along Pennington Bend here about uh, possible voluntary buyout programs. It's my understanding of the 40-some properties, uh, Metro Stormwater has made offers to about 18 or so. Um, I would like to see uh, how those play out before we grant variances. Um, if, if not, um, then we can come back here. Um, but. Uh, um, it, it's it's difficult. I'm I'm a pro business guy, but I also have a conscience. Um, this is if we continue on this this path, um, we're going to be building the level of density that caused the level of destruction that we saw in, in 2010. Um, and, and two other points. I think this first gentleman here didn't necessarily identify himself. I, I wasn't sure what his his role is um, in, in this. And I think it is also disingenuous. Um, uh, no disrespect intended to Miss O'Neill, but she identifies herself as a neighbor, but she didn't identify what her business relationship is here, either with the developer and or the property. So I think that is that is important. Um, the other people that wrote uh, wrote you, uh, Miami LLC, the uh, the Rudys, um, they think that they can build a hotel on the on the tip of Miami Avenue. Um, I, I mean, I, I sometimes it's like don't don't shoot the messenger, um, but uh, they they um, there, there, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that a commercial property is going to be uh, able to be built uh, along here. Um, so I. I I understand their concerns. They were at the, the meeting that we had, and they, and they think they have every right to build a hotel. Um, it, it's uh, it's one of these uh, inherent risks of owning property along along the uh, the, the floodway here. 
Um, so I, I empathize with the situation of the individual neighbors, but at the end of the day, there is an inherent risk of owning a, a piece of land along the, uh, the river here. Um, I ask that you please deny this uh, variance request. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone from the public here to speak either in opposition or in support of the variance request? Seeing none, um, Mr. Smith, I believe you said you wanted to be able to have time to respond to some of the comments, and that's fine, and then we'll open it up to the committee members for questions. Thank you. Um, I'll respond to the council uh, person first. Uh, Trip Smith, SH Group, LLC, uh, the civil engineer um, for, the, for the plan and the project. Um, I'd like to first address the floodplain comment. Um, we are entirely outside of the base flood elevation of 420.1 feet based on the FEMA firm map um, with all structures. There is some disturbance um, as necessary for construction, um, erosion controls, um, grass pavers that would provide the potential dock access walkway that would be permeable. Uh, within the floodplain, but all existing contours would be planned to be matched. Um, and the finished floor elevation of the structures would be four feet above that 420.1 uh, base flood elevation. Uh, so that would be outside of the 100 year floodplain. Um, I'd also like to reiterate that the current state of the property, um, there is not a vegetated buffer there. Um, the, really the only vegetation, um, both through pictures and through aerial GIS that's visible is once you um, begin to hit the river bank, um, really to the extent of the 100 foot, or I'm sorry, the 50 foot zone one buffer, um, there's really nothing other than the two existing trees which we would be keeping. Um, and just scrub brush overgrowth grass um, that from what I've seen when we put out the signs, kind of dies off in the wintertime. Um, and we would be restoring that with proper native vegetation and providing a, a buffer to the fullest extent possible, um, planting six new trees, uh, 85 new shrubs and grasses uh, within that width of the zone one buffer, um, and arguably leaving it better than we found it, um, other than the fact of the structures being in the zone two buffer. Um, the last thing I want to touch on is these unique characteristics and how that's defined and applied. And I know there was great debate and discussion based on language that was presented uh, in a FEMA guidance document, um, a pamphlet or a bulletin, and how that would be applied and reviewed um, and considered uh, based on um, if that was good and sufficient cause and if that was a, an actual hardship. Um, and I, I just want to present, not that I'm saying um, that past precedent holds, um, I, I understand each case is decided independently on the facts and the evidence presented in each case. Um, but there is a property two streets down, I believe it's 2301 Pennington Bed Road. This was May 12, 2011, uh, a year after the flood, um, well after all of the floodway buffers have been enacted. Um, the disturbance for this property was much more significant than what we are proposing. The house was built up to the floodway line. Um, the house resides entirely within the zone one buffer. Um, and the reasoning for granting the variance, um, the first reason for granting approval were, one, this is a unique lot. Two, the structure will be out of the floodway. Three, the structure will be above the floodplain. Four, the request is for disturbance of the buffer only. Um, there's some water quality offset being provided for the buffer disturbance, and I think this was a rehearing, so the revised plan was no different than the original plan. Um, again, I, I understand each case is different. I would just ask that uh, and request that the committee consider these facts, um, consider prior precedent, um, prior rulings, prior appeals granted, um, and not entirely focus and have um, the uniqueness definition of the specific lot or the lots on that side of Pennington Bend be the sole factor um, for determining whether a variance request is valid and whether, an, and whether it can be granted. Um, and I think that's all I'll have. 
Thank you. With that, we'll open uh, discussion questions to the committee. Okay. Um, when you have complexity, it helps to get clarity with information and facts. So uh, one thing that would help me is um, seeing a photograph of 2010 flooding of this site. I don't think we've seen one yet. Okay, I, I missed it. Can we have put that back up there? Just to remind us all. Okay. All right. All right. And then um, uh, can we zoom out a bit in a non-flooded condition? Let me let me see the developed area that exists there now. Okay. So the parcel in question is near that uh, where that uh, yellow rectangle is. Okay. All right, so um, let, uh, can I ask the councilman to come back up, Mr. Chairman? Would that be appropriate to ask him a question or two? Sure. Okay. Hello. Okay, so, you know, I, 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 I'm trying to look at this from both uh, our regulatory responsibility in terms of buffers and floodways, and, but I'm, you know, as a person with an urban planning background, I, um, part of the assessment of metro policy that has guided our decisions here is is our land use decisions. Okay. Sure. So, so, uh, and I think I think you would have a unique perspective about this because you you probably routinely review land use questions in the council. Um, what what does this configuration of development tell you about um, this these parcels as it relates to uh, the concept of of a concentrated array of development in this area. Sure, Th this is very similar to what we did uh, more on the south side of, uh, of Pennington Bend here, where we allowed uh, three homes fairly close together to each other. Um, it just adds an incredible amount of density, dissimilar from what is currently there and with other single family homes. Um, I'll tell you that the developer came up to me after the meeting um, that we had to propose the voluntary buyout, and, and he suggested, well, what about two houses instead of three? Never heard from him. Um, so, I, you know, so we're trying to push it here now to see that we can just maximize value um, and, and, and return to, to investment. I get that. Like I said, I'm, I'm pro-business, but you also... Uh, have to be very careful about the level of density that, that you put on a road like this. Um, so. is it, sorry. Is it fair to say that um, um, are we likely to see more development on the, I'm assuming that's north is at the top? Sure. Okay, as, as normal. So uh, so on the east side of Pennington Bend Road, are, are we likely to see more development? No, on the east side of Pennington Bend, on the other side, um, you've, you've got uh, one of the last uh, working cattle farms of uh, in Davidson County. You've got um, uh, the Abington Park, which is already under development. You've got Miami Avenue then, so, um, and then you've got the Gaylord Springs um, uh, golf course there further down. Um, so. No, I don't anticipate uh, uh, anything else. And I think it's higher up also. I mean, staff can, can confirm that, but I think o over there, it's a little higher up than, than here. Okay. Especially on the south side of, of Pennington Bend. Okay, so that, that's why we're seeing this concentration of, of current development on, on the south uh, end of, of this photograph and uh, on the east side. Uh, of Pinto Bend Road because that's a bit of a ridge that their right. staff contours support that as well. We put a contour map on there. 
I will say from a broader perspective, I had uh, in, in looking at this thing from uh, comparative to my district to, uh, to other districts, from, from my understanding, uh, the development potential with variance requests um, on, uh, here on Pennington Bend is somewhat unique from the rest of the, the county. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the rest of the county has this level of possible development potential with variance requests that, uh, um, that the 15th does. Okay. So this thank is a, a rather unique area, unique street for sure. Okay. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Another question too. Sure. Uh, so you were talking about density. So if this uh, proposal incorporated those into one lot for one house, would your feelings about this be any different? It might be if, if you're reducing the amount of, of, of density that and, and improving the the amount of flood storage capacity and and and, uh, and and whatnot. I mean that that would have to be something that I don't think that it's even been discussed with with neighbors. So I'd have to get to their their input on that first. But uh, um, you know, any, any level of compromise is always uh, welcome rather than just trying to push the the maximum amount of density that you can currently get. Well, it's just something That's I heard parents. during the discussion. I think one of the neighbors talked about a larger house, and I think even maybe the Lawler property, um, um, the variances that they had requested before incorporated maybe several smaller parcels into one. Yeah, so. I believe so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, so that, that's kind of where I was headed, was um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand Metro's land use policy um, goals here. Um, I know the applicant stated she had originally planned on developing a home for herself there, uh, as opposed to three individual developments. Um, so, um, um, so that 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 definitely flavors, you know, our view of the current proposal, or at least it flavors it for me. Um, uh, what, you know, if, if, if I were looking at an individual home on this lot, I, I would look at this entire site as a higher density zone that Metro government has allowed to develop densely on the east side of the road and, and much less density on the west side of the road. Uh, and then uh, if I were to look at a lot north of here without development on the east side of the road and with very little development on the west side of the road, I might even take a, a much more stringent approach than even a single family house in order to protect the zone two buffer. So, and, and that's just me. Uh, uh, so, um, um, what, what, I, what I really appreciate about this proposal, I think what we all appreciate as board members, is an applicant that comes in and presents an honest case and is pleasant about it <laughs> and has done their homework, has looked at what we typically try to work with applicants on in terms of what we think is appropriate in terms of, of a variance. I think you're honest about the hardship. We, we can't honor financial hardship. Um, um, frankly, we hear lots of statements about hardship that, that, that make common sense to all of us. It's a hardship to deal with regulations, but when you go through due process to put a regulation in place, that's the law. And so a variance is trying to change something that we've already decided as a community to do. And so uh, um, that, that's a hardship on some, but it's not technically the legal hardship we have to deal with. The legal hardship we have to deal with is that this lot is so unique that it doesn't fall within the normal parameters of a lot that's being regulated by the buffers. That, that's the kind of hardship that we're allowed to, to consider, to at least to be on a, a, a really sound legal standing. So uh, um, that being said, I, I, I'm, I'm personally having a hard time with the density of the proposal. And um, uh, I really appreciate that you stayed out of the zone one. And, and I'm, 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 uh, I've said many times here that I, I really wish the Planning Commission would work with us on reducing setbacks, which they did in this case. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be heard about that because that takes pressure off these buffers and gives people with investment expectations the opportunity to realize those investment expectations. 
Um, uh, I just think something else could be done here to make this more workable. Not saying I would vote for it, but uh, uh, the current proposal is a little more than, than what the current land use policy appears to be saying and what I think makes sense for the buffer. So. I think I'm gonna mirror a lot of what you just said. In, in the discussions from the community, they talked about damaged homes. These would be built above the floodplain that wouldn't be damaged. Uh, they're outside of any FEMA regulated floodway line. They would be only in the zone one buffer. Uh, but I listened to the council member. This is my former council district. I know everybody here. <laughs> um, and, I, and I know their concerns. Uh, I've known them for years. And um, I think that they've presented a very good case. I think in my heart that there is uh, a hardship here. But uh, like Dodd mentioned, I think that we can also consider, uh, if we do consider granting a variance, I think there's other things that we can look at. And I think the development pattern and the size of the homes there, I think, come into play. And so um, I would more or less, I think I would ask the applicant to maybe look at some of the adjacent houses. Maybe this reduces this to two lots or two larger houses instead of three smaller ones. Uh, I think that uh, if you were to do that, I think that uh, you would probably get the support that you need here, but I'm hesitant too about the three houses. I really am. Um, and so I would maybe ask you to consider that. You might wanna just you know, ask for this to be deferred perhaps, hear from other committee members and see what they have to say. But that's sort of where I'm leading right now. Yeah, I have a um, very similar, I guess, mindset in the fact that you know, when we're looking at the property, one of the things the committee asked is what alternatives were evaluated, and it says none, but that's under the assumption that you're looking at putting three homes, and so that's where I would challenge kind of back is kind of step back, reframe expectations, and bring something modified to the table. I, th I really believe if you do that, you probably will create something that may have greater value. I, and, and if you could put that flood map back up there, um, you know, uh, j just for the public's benefit and, and your benefit and, and our benefit, you know, this type of flood is not regulated. This type of flood is not regulated. That doesn't mean it doesn't flood. You know, we, so um, it's not in the regulated floodplain, the development that you're proposing or that you'll probably come back with in a zone two, because that's about the best you're gonna be able to do unless you build a razor thin house out of the zone two. But, um, um, you know, one of the questions we debated too is, is if you come back with a house, with a one house proposal for this site, does that mean we have one more person to rescue, one more person to buy out as it appears that these flood cycles are getting worse and worse? I think we had 10, or excuse me, three 10 inch storms last year, um, 10 inch rainfalls, um, which is, you know, we're, we're seeing a higher frequency of these bigger rainfalls. We're seeing a higher frequency around the nation of catastrophic floods. Uh, Houston flooded um, much worse because of their development patterns, not just because <coughs> of unnatural flooding. Um, so we do have a responsibility not to make it worse and not to put more people in harm's way through our development policy, but we don't regulate that. So uh, um, this is also a bit of a buyer beware kind of perspective, even though we don't protect people against that kind of buying decision. So, uh, so anyway, I just want to say that. Can um, somebody refresh my memory? Um, I'm having a hard time. The two that we denied this year, the one gentleman that wanted to build two homes and then the young couple that the Lawlers mentioned, were they building into zone one? Is that why we denied it? Yes. No. Um, I, I don't know for sure both, but at least one of them was only in zone two, I believe. Does staff recall? We had one on Miami and one on Pennington. <clears throat> the last was the younger couple that was coming into town. Um, I don't remember whether they were building into zone one. And then the, uh, the gentleman before that uh, had lived, I think, for a while on Miami or owned the property for a while. And he had, I don't remember whether he was going into zone one either. I don't recall. I, I, for some reason, I wanna say they were fully in the zone one, but 
I can't be sure. We have so many. <laughs> As I recall, it was impossible for them to develop because we weren't going to let them at all go into either of the zones. And we weren't giving them the option of just pulling out of one of the zones. That, that's what I recall, but I don't know that that was applied equally to both applicants. So we, we could, uh, you know, we, there, there's a variety of options here. You can withdraw and resubmit, but you have to pay new fees if you do that. We could vote to defer, which would give you the chance to rethink it, um, assuming there'd be a consensus on that. Uh, and we could always also just outright deny it. It doesn't sound like we're leaning towards approval. Um, so. Um, I I'm not sure if we have to request the voluntary deferral or if you guys vote to, defer, but we'd be willing to take your advice to. Um, I think we just want your input. I mean, if, okay. if, if you don't have a problem with being deferred, I think that's what we want to do. I, I mean, if uh, you think you want to move forward give, and you want to. You know. No, given, given the comment, I yeah. think we'd like the opportunity to yeah. defer. Um, and, and looking back even at the case, um, you know, where the one house was done, if we're looking at surface area footprint, um, you know, it's roughly 25, 2,600 square foot of surface area mm -hmm. of, of impervious structure. And, you know, the three units is, is in excess of that. Um, and so if, um, if we can work with the council person, potentially the neighbors, to uh, agree to some sort of compromise, I think that'd be beneficial uh, for I think everyone. I too. I mean, that's why I think okay. we're sort of leaning that direction. So that, uh, I appreciate that. And what I, what I do recall from the September meeting is uh, with the couple that you guys were discussing is that... Um, the structure was built within the floodplain. It was just on stilts and elevated. Right. And so I don't know if that was the only reason why you guys denied it um, or if it was more that unique um, definition. Do you remember whether or not it was completely in zone one? I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, we just confirmed it was fully in zone one for the Kai Single property. Okay. Yeah. I think we have concerns about the floodplain too. I think this, mm -hmm. this, the properties that we're looking at now are, are in a higher spot of the, along mm -hmm. the bend, right? Yeah. So, okay. And, and um, you know, one thing that may help a bit, I, you know, typically I take more an environmental perspective, but, you know, when you have an investment expectation for one house that precedes a law that was passed, um, of course, you had the opportunity to express that concern in the public hearings and the regulatory review and the process uh, that was undertaken in passing the buffers. It was a good 10 years after, I think, you purchased the lot. So you had lots of opportunities to provide input to that. But, um, you know, I, I would want to hear more about, uh, maybe from Roger and others when this comes back, about public safety concerns, emergency access, um, um, and that type of thing. Those, those, the fact that you've stayed out of the zone one and the fact that we have found opportunities to compromise in the zone two uh, and the fact that we have this type of concentrated development in this portion of Pennington Bend that, that possibly would not grow outside of this area um, make it harder to... Uh, to not think about a compromise. So. Okay. <clears throat> well, it sounds like you're going to request a deferral. I just state that um, this type of density discussion, past my recollection, has only been used to determine hardship analysis in the past, and that we're kind of stepping outside of what we're really supposed to be doing here. I just, I'm say that. I think that legal had given us advice a few months ago talking about our ability to include uh, planning issues or land use policies. Well, I, I, one thing I was thinking of in terms of the density, I don't know if you would consider it relevant to this, but one of the main considerations that you take into account in terms of a variance is um, whether, whether, whether you can make a determination that the variance is the minimum necessary considering the flood hazard to afford relief. Um, uh, but that, yes, there are um, various other variables that you can take into consideration into um, 
uh, the process of granting um, a permit, um, the compatibility of the proposed use with existing and um, anticipated development has kind of a planning feel to it. Um, uh, let me skim through these other ones here. Um, certainly the um, concerns about um, emergency vehicle access, um, the cost to the government of providing services during and after flood conditions, um, uh, maintenance of public utilities, um, uh, the relationship of the proposed use to comprehensive plan and master drainage plans for the area. Michael's yeah. looking at something else. Uh, yeah, in, in buffer modifications in particular, it, it, it emphasizes that it should be the minimum necessary to achieve a reasonable buildable area um, and that other requirements for building in the floodway shall apply. So there are kind of a variety of considerations, and these are all from the, um, the um, committee's um, internal operating rules and regulations in Appendix F of the Stormwater Management Manual. So, so basic compatibility is something we could consider. Uh, and most of the things you talked about would be density driven or related as far as pro providing public services and emergency services and all that. So I mean, I think that that's something that we can consider. I don't think we get into architecture or anything like that as far as compatibility, but I think we can start to look at placement of buildings and what's, what you said was the minimum, you know, that we could approve. Necessary you know, buildable right. areas. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm comfortable that, with that. that I mean, that's, that's exactly my point. That's what I'm saying. We're not supposed to be looking at land use, but we can certainly look at density when it comes to hardship and analyzing the hardship on the property. And so that, and that's my point. And in all past times we've done that, that's all we've been doing. And it seems like we may have gone a little bit outside that today. It, I, it's state that only, an, an I state that only case. for the purpose of the applicant, if they're going to ask to defer, I want to make sure I, I say that statement because in the past, density is looked at only with respect to the hardship and there in the property. And I just don't know that you can put one house on this and get it past this committee based on the last decision this committee well, made. Well, I think that so. they, they have, uh, you know, if they are willing to go talk to the council member and work with the neighbors, and I'm hopeful that maybe they can come up with something. Um, I think they can. I just want to make the statement. Appreciate it. Any other comments? Yeah, I was just going to clarify that the um, minimum necessary condition is actually a separate and additional condition um, that you're supposed to take into consideration in considering whether to grant variance in addition to the exceptional hardship condition. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Chairman, may I make a comment real quick? Certainly. Uh, one lot or three lots, I'm not sure you're going to have a difference in ISR. Uh, while you may actually have uh, the public safety concern of having only rescue one person versus three. Um, I just wanted to throw it out there that you may not get a reduced ISR based on one lot versus three, though. Oh, ISR would be an uh, impervious uh, surface ratio. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. And, and y y you may wonder why we, why we kind of sound like we're kind of bouncing back and forth. You know, we're, we're trying to give you lots of information because any additional time you spend on this, you're probably paying someone to think about it more for you, and then you're gonna come back and you're gonna spend more time and more money. You know, all of these are considerations in whether or not you really wanna go forward with that additional investment and taking the risk that it might not be approved, so. Okay. That said, either someone from the, our body can make a motion for a deferral for a particular amount of period of time, or the applicant can request a deferral for a particular amount of time. Um, do we have to specify the time period now? Could we make it an indefinite deferral that could be enacted upon the first week of the month or what's typical for the, the breakdown or do I need just like 60 days, two let months? Me, let, me, let me get ask it legal. Okay. Hang on, I just closed the book. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, at the conclusion of all evidence of uh, in all cases heard at the hearing session, the committee shall discuss cases and re render decisions in executive session on that date or defer decisions for no longer than 30 days thereafter. Um, having said that, um, I suppose you could say that it may be um, kind of um, uh, adjourned um, without all the evidence having been presented if the applicant's going to kind of alter their request. Um, so 
I would still see some discretion there for you to defer longer than 30 days if that is the case. So that being said, if you want to defer for a longer than 30 days, then we'll certainly entertain that. Okay, I, I think 60 would be an adequate amount of time to be able to coordinate and then modify plans accordingly and maybe even get some feedback from staff as to what they felt. So, so the applicant has asked for a 60-day deferral. Um, you have a motion to vote on their request. I so move. Second. Second. Seeing a motion and a second to uh, vote on the applicant's request for a 60-day deferral. Uh, let's vote on it all in favor of the of the deferral for 60 days, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, so the motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, everybody, for keeping that discussion moving. We did a great job on that one, I thought. Um, let's go to the third case to be heard that the applicant wants to come up. Uh, this is um, Donaldson Station. This is referred to 135 Donaldson Pike. Um, we probably should go ahead and read into the record again, Mrs. Gilbert, the statement beforehand. It's now been a few hours. Our opening statement to the applicant, if you're not satisfied with the decision made, by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of centuria with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision. You are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Thank you. Now, if staff could read into the uh, record the applicant's request. Good morning, committee. Um, uh, this is uh, item number three, uh, uh, 2017-00035, Donaldson Station, 135 Donaldson Pike. APN is 0960500. 09900 and there are actually four other parcels associated with that track which are 0960101370000960500096000 and 096 <coughs> excuse me 0500950 the MPDS inspector is Donald Irves. This is Council District 15. Um, and the request for, for the, uh, by the applicant is to allow the following. Uh, two crossings of an existing stream less than 1,000 feet. There's also an additional request to that that is mentioned in the application. Uh, one of the crossings uh, proposed uh, varies more than 15 degrees from the uh, uh, from perpendicular. Um, the appellant is Reagan Smith. Uh, that's another correction there. And the representative is uh, Zach Swafford. <coughs> comments, staff comments are as following. If the variance is approved, a staff requests that the species diversity is increased so that no species comprises more than 20% of the native trees proposed that run off from the, the dog park, which I don't believe is shown here, um, but is was part of the plan at least, uh, is routed through water quality treatment. Um, codes, that no comments were provided. Planning the site plan for the re requested variance is consistent with the approved preliminary SP uh, approved and Greenways defers to stormwater management decision. Thank you very much. With that, we we'll, uh, turn to the applicant for his presentation. I'm Laura Jones. I'm here representing Reagan Smith and BNA Investments today. Thank you for taking time to hear our variance request. And Today we are discussing the Donaldson Station development. As you can see on the screen in front of you, this is a transit-oriented development. Um, it encourages density where we want density in an infill situation within walking distance of the Donaldson Station serving the Music City Star. You can see that on the vicinity map. 
Um, there has been a neighborhood meeting and there was overwhelming support for this development by the neighborhood as well as by Councilman Syracuse. He is here to speak on that shortly. The variance requested today is for the installation of two three-sided box culverts, open-sided culverts along the same water feature located approximately 225 feet apart. The entire site is located within the Lower Stones River watershed and is completely bisected by a low quality water feature. We completed a hydrologic determination of a concrete channel and determined that it was indeed a stream due to the presence of flow even after an absence of rain. Therefore, it was determined to be a stream. The water feature has a very minimal watershed and does not appear on the USGS topo maps. It is, as I said, fully concrete lined and has limited existing vegetation. You can see a picture here of the water course bisecting the property and also one of the photos of the water course. The channel top of bank is about 12 feet in width and three and a half feet at the bank full depth. And the concrete conveyance has been there for at least since 1999. That's as far back as we were able to figure out that it was concrete lined. There is a narrow riparian buffer on both sides of the channel. It has some canopy trees existing, which will be maintained, but the understory is primarily non-native, exotic, and invasive species, mm -hmm. such as privet and bush honeysuckle. The secondary crossing for this request is being provided to provide, fi to provide fire truck access. In order to serve both parts of the property, we need to be able to provide the fire truck a loop access. That's why there are two crossings instead of one. This is to meet the emergency services access requirements. It also provides the most direct route for pedestrian accessibility of the existing right of way on the north side of the property, as well as the accessible path serving the facility. Since this is a transit oriented development, pedestrian ac accessibility is very important. Several alternative site plans were considered. However, none of them met the requirements of the fire code for health and safety to provide a loop access. Therefore, this site plan is the proposed one. Reagan Smith has revised the site layout to minimize and avoid any buffer impacts. We utilized a foundation wall on the east side of the building A to minimize grading. We have utilized site retaining walls to minimize grading throughout the site and preserve the entire buffer. We have been working with staff in order to change the stormwater layout so that we consolidated all stormwater flows into three discharge points so that they will discharge through the headwalls of the three-sided culverts rather than creating any other headwalls in the buffer. In addition, the footers of the three-sided culverts are outside of the top of bank, so they entirely span the channel. We are working with staff in the technical review currently to be fully compliant with all LID requirements and regulations. Additionally, we are significantly reducing the curve number on this site through the use of entirely pervious pavers for the development. As you can see, there's an existing canopy which will be remaining in place. We also have prepared a mitigation plan to work around the existing trees and to provide nine canopy trees and six understory trees within the buffer. These are in addition to the TU, TDU requirement. As you heard from the staff comment, they have requested that we increase the species. We agree with that comment and we would like to add two more species to that. Currently we have the sugar maple, sweet gum and the dogwood. We're going to add the yellow wood and the eastern redbud to that to increase our species diversity. We are also proposing a riparian seed mix, which contains eight native grasses and 12 native wildflowers to be applied to the entire buffer area. We are proposing hand removal of invasive species 
of the privet and, in, and the honeysuckle, and we have requested that the removal of the invasive species remain for the next three years. So it will be maintained, they will go back in and remove the species again. We've been very specific on how the species need to be removed and that has to be done through the certified process since it isn't a buffer. We have our design team here to answer any questions that you might have. This is Matt Lackey. He is the engineer of record. Scott Burnick is the landscape architect and we have Nick Alder who is here representing the client. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we'll now turn to the public and the councilman if you wanted to speak. Um, is there anyone else other than the councilman here to support or in opposition of the project? Wonderful. Please take the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council, uh, committee members. Um, it, uh, the whole development team worked very well with the community about this. Um, it is very exciting in that it uh, right is on the border of uh, what is poised to be the very first transit-oriented redevelopment district in the state of Tennessee, um, using the uh, new legislation that uh, um, that the legislature passed uh, last session. So, uh, very exciting. The first multifamily development has part of the uh, planned um, um, uh, downtown Donaldson urban design overlay that. Uh, uh, that we passed back in 2009. So this is helping to really kind of kick off that vision. So it, it seems to be a very minimally invasive uh, variance request. And so this is, uh, uh, I, I certainly uh, ask you to approve it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, with that, uh, we'll turn uh, to discussion uh, or questions uh, from the committee. Okay, I'm gonna get us started. Um, so the the concrete channel, um, you're proposing that will remain as is, okay. We are, and the reason for that is after completing a site visit, it was evident that in order to remove the concrete channel, we would have to also remove all of the existing canopy trees. Mm -hmm. We feel like there's enough canopy trees in there that there are some benefits to that. And even though we would be able to replant those canopy trees, we would have a temporary loss during the time when we're waiting for those canopy trees to mature. That being said, if the committee feels like that is in the best interest, we certainly will continue to discuss that further and consider that possibility, but that's why it was not proposed. Okay, um, you know, what, what I like about this is that you, you minimized your crossing as, as much as you can. You've got some encroachment by virtue of the fact that you have to have some supporting abutments on either side of your of your bridge um, that, that encroach more than the bridge does, but you do have a, a very narrow bridge. You could have just made it a wide span all the way across. Um, uh, was there no way to, um, uh, well, well, let me ask this. The contours at the bottom of this photograph of this engineering design plan here, are those field contours or those natural contours or are those enhanced in some way what's already there? By bottom, bottom of the page. Yes, the, I couldn't see. But the yeah. highlight, the yellow highlighted area. <coughs> Those are uh, new contours. Okay. And um, so, was there no way you could do like a, a a broad sort of bridge span across there without having, so you'd have more of a vertical uh, configuration there instead of a field. I I think I understand what you're. At asking and could you do a instead of like a 15 foot wide box culvert do a 20 foot or <coughs> or, walls or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Extend, we, we we can definitely um okay. do that okay great and and on the north side i'm assuming those are f those are not created contours or are they looks like on the on the upper side that may be created, maybe on the lower side you didn't need to do as much. We do also have a sewer line that we are trying to avoid having any type of structure over the top of. When we met with staff at the um, pre-application meeting, um, it was stated that we needed to avoid putting any type of structure over the top of the sewer line. So that's one of the reasons for the grading. On the upper side, okay. All right, so staff, y'all okay with that? Would, if 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 there's consensus among the committee to ask for a, a wider span on the bottom bridge 
and a and to leave the top for the reasons that they just stated as is would you all feel like that's a little better approach to this certainly certainly would agree to that i, I would state that i believe that sewer line uh does run through the second the south box as well it does okay. it's so on both would, boxes they, they would okay. be limited on the south as well okay. as to okay. how far at least they could extend the box okay. to the west okay all right, then, then that, that, you know, monkey with those kind of things and those kind of details in this context is dangerous. So I, I'm just going to leave that up to you all to work out, and, and we'll see how the, how the board views this. So and we would also like to um, amend the, the request that um, the, the trees that were going to be planted over the sewer line, if we could shift those to another portion, because it turns out we don't want trees on top of the sewer line. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll be happy to relocate yeah. those so that they are not over the top of the sewer line. Yeah, I've, I've had experience with uh, stopped up sewer lines due to elm trees before. So so, uh, um, so that, that brings me back to the concrete channel uh, issue. And I, I'm just looking for opportunities to mitigate the loss of, of lots of sunlight and lots of tree canopy because we have an extra bridge because basically what we're dealing with here is the extra stream crossing that's the primary focus of this so does staff see any opportunity to to um, do something creative in the concrete apron of the flowway it's going to sound really out of the box but you know you know cutting um, uh, boreholes into the into the bottom of the concrete to help infiltrate more water into the ground to uh, uh, soften some of the some of the impact by mitigating that in some ways creatively. Have you all ever had any experience with doing anything like that? I've never come across anything like that myself. So I'm, I, I'm just I trying to think outside the it. box. Um, I, I don't. I don't know what drilling into the concrete would do to its integrity, and if we did, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. we, I guess we'd have to have an engineer look at flows and, okay. and maybe find. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, it was out of the box. Uh, Commissioner, okay. uh, we we had a similar situation at uh, River Plantation where there was a concrete line ditch, and some of it was kind of cracking, and uh, as soon as you introduce water, it started cracking yeah. up a lot, and yeah. you have to do a yeah. lot of work. Yeah, that's right. If it wasn't yeah. designed for that, it, it won't function that well. Okay, so. Um, um, I'll, I'll just make this last comment. I, I uh, like the councilman. I, I, th there's a lot of broader benefits to this site, and and their staff seems to support the mitigation. Uh, I'm particularly impressed that you picked a yellow wood. Uh, you know, there's a famous botanist that came through Tennessee around the beginning of our nation who identified the yellow wood in Jackson County, Tennessee, and. Governor Ned McWhorter planted one on the Capitol grounds one year because it is so indigenous to Tennessee and it's almost disappeared from the landscape. So that's you know your stuff when you're when you're picking yellow woods for your for your tree diversity. So uh, with that, I'll hush and listen to the rest of the board members. There is a staff comment about a dog park. Is that still included in the plan or that has been removed okay. from the plan? Um, that is going to remain a green space, open space, but it will no longer be a designated dog park. Were there any other staff comments or requests that the applicant had an issue with? I can't remember. As far as staff comments specific to the variance, there, there are none, no sir. We, we're obviously dealing with regular comments for just to approve the grading permit, but outside of, for the variance there. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, seeing, not seeing any more questions or comments, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the request. Can I quickly please, just sir, comment please. Real quick? Uh, in case there's some issues with the sewer line and the retaining walls, uh, I know it's not traditional to say that we could potentially have staff uh, look at some minor changes without coming back, but if there's potential for some wall changes that, uh, that we could deal with at staff level, we would love to be given the opportunity to be able to handle that versus taking it back over here. Thank you. If, if you would consider it. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the variance as requested uh, with the um, condition that staff be given the opportunity to 
uh, make any slight modifications with respect to the uh, sewer line location. As well as tree placement, I think Rebecca Dillon mentioned that as well. That's what I meant. Oh, I meant, that's what you meant yeah. Okay. So I second that. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Um, any discussion on the motion? Saying none. I've put the motion up for a vote. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it's unanimous. The motion passes. Thank you very much. All right, that is the last case to be heard today. Um, so we'll go to the items of new business. I know one of the things we've been discussing is the procedure we're going to follow here. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time with the timer and stuff. and. Luckily, I didn't come too much into play today, but I was afraid it was going to with the Pennington Bend um, request. Uh, but so that, I guess that was one item we'd want to just figure out what our update on that is. Great. So I have made up a new one, and I wanted to bring it to the to committee today, not for you guys to necessarily see at this point, but to at least to see uh, how, how it was going to flow and uh, make the corrections and hopefully bring it to you at the very next meeting. All right, go ahead. Um, but there is, there is something. Uh, I, I have added a uh, rebuttal time in here. Uh, and I just want to make sure it was okay uh, to proceed with the rebuttal time. It looked like you you did allow that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a fair thing to have. I, I think I try to cap the applicant's time to five minutes initially with uh, everybody else being able to present two minutes. So the, you've got the first, the, the, the presentation itself is a five-minute presentation? Not or just that presentation, but the applicant's the presentation. The applicant's is a, a five-minute presentation. Yes, sir. And then each... Uh, person from the public that wants to speak in support or opposition gets two minutes for the mic? Exactly. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I've, I've had a request from a, a routine participant of this body to, um, of the audience to uh, consider a third category. It's kind of a Swiss government kind of like neutrality kind of category. Where they, Swiss government. <laughs> yeah, where where they, they don't want to be identified as, a, as opposed or against or for, but they want to they offer technical and scientific input. And so I, I, don't, I don't know of anything that exists like that in, in any, I watch a lot of, I'm a geek about watching a lot of Metro TV. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I've never, I, when, I, when I'm a really, interested in doing that and uh, and so uh, but I've never seen that kind of category but it 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 does it does allow some nonprofits in town and, and other people to have us have input at least what they perceive to be neutral it probably will not be perceived that by everybody as being neutral but they they want to be identified more in a neutral category so I, so, I think it might help given all the science and technical debate that we have I pulled up the Planning Commission uh, public hearing rules, and uh, I think that was the, the guidance that I was told, uh, hey, let's see if we can't go to something like that. Uh, during the Planning Commission uh, meeting at the public comments, you, you actually have to go in there and say, uh, you know, when they call you in support or against. However, there's been many cases where you go up there and say, I, I, I'm speaking in the line that says I'm in for it, but I'm not really for it. I'm just neutral. I just wanted to speak. Um, so they didn't have a third category. I'm more than willing to entertain and add it if, if you guys choose or. It's just tugging at my American heartstring because this <laughs> is not American concept. So uh, I'll say that and then. You know, I, I, I don't think it would complicate things because I think it's going to be rare. I honestly don't think it will be terribly unbiased and it'll be self-evident. I don't think it would hurt to add it. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's going to complicate things because if, if we create a third category, They'll just go third instead of in either first or second uh, order, and so I, I just think it will encourage us to get more input. But it's up to the full board. Whatever you guys like. Um, I don't think five minutes will be enough time for an applicant to present. Uh, Planning commission, I think, is ten minutes. You can you can reserve up to two minutes to rebut. And when I appear before the planning commission, you'll be surprised how quickly eight minutes will go. So I don't if, if we're I don't think five minutes is enough for an applicant to do a, a full uh, board presentation. I agree with your point. I didn't think about yeah. that, but yeah, I mean, I, you, certainly too, we can do uh, say t t ten minutes and then even give the opportunity to request more. Yeah, I mean, because there's certain like the I, I mean, one example would be the uh, Capital View project. And there's no way they could have done that in no ten way. minutes. That was, exactly. a, that was a thirty minute hour presentation. Exactly. So, so if we're going to try to establish something, I think 
we should give them a little more time. Ten was saving two of the rebuttal, just yeah, like Yeah, I think so. And, okay. and then, um, I don't know about the third category. I'm sort of struggling with that one a little bit. Um, I just don't want to see us create a third category. And then, I know you think right now there may not be that many people, but it could open the door to have numerous other groups or individuals wanting to come up here and, and speak out on all these issues. I think that, can they not communicate with us? Does that violate rules? If they're, if they're not for or against, if they're just providing support, is that, a, is that something they could provide to staff or that could be distributed or is that? I mean, I think that it's, it, it, as long as it's occurring in the context of an open meeting, you mm -hmm. know, that, I mean, that's usually the concern is, is just, um, their, their kind of unwillingness to identify with either the for folks or the against folks. Um, I'm not sure I really see a legal issue with that as long as the full substance of their comments is part of the record and- Well, I was um, talking about communicating to staff and have staff provide information to us. Oh, oh uh, yeah, yeah, generally, um, actually, Deborah and I were talking about this a little bit right before the meeting started, um, that in, in general, we, we do want to be careful, um, the members of the committee need to be careful not to have ex parte communication with um, persons who might come before this committee on a, you know, matter requesting a variance or on an appeal, um, because, um, because you do, for the most part, sit in a... Um, more of an administrative or quasi-judicial capacity, that obviously wouldn't be true, say, for example, of the, the council. You know, they have to be able to communicate with their constituents about the matters that are, that they're gonna legislate on, but your role is a little bit different, and so there is an AG opinion that suggests that you should avoid ex parte communication. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like if someone's gonna speak before us, that I think that their input is not really unbiased. I think they're gonna miss, basically have, it's gonna be either for or against. Uh, and to basically say that we need more technical expertise is basically saying that we're not knowledgeable enough or something. I don't know. It, it just, something about it concerns me. I'm not so sure I, I entirely understand. Are they proposing that they would not be limited to the two-minute limit? No, it doesn't have to do the time limit. I just think that individuals that want to speak and just provide you know, their input should probably speak either on the for side or the against side. I and think they, they can, could pick either one, and the substance of one. their comments is what it is. I so. think it is, and if they want to say at that point in time that it's a non-biased, you know, they can do that. But I think to create a third category, to me, it's just going to open the door to a lot of um, other. Uh, I don't know. I'm 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 struggling with it. Okay, so that's just me. Yeah. 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 Maybe it's someone that, that wants to be heard as an expert, and that maybe it isn't. I just. Uh, yeah, you guys are, or y'all deal with probably this more than I do from the technical perspective of, of all these individuals that are out there that have all this experience probably in the environmental field. And so uh, I feel comfortable with the people that we have on this committee, uh, Carrie and, and Dodd especially, to have that expertise. I think we have it. So uh, I would prefer that if someone wants to speak, they just decide to speak in the for or the against line and I think the setting a third category just makes me a little uncomfortable. Yeah, the, the, the perspective that was presented to me was from a, a nonprofit that avoids litigating activity and, and that they, in, in, in order to stay sort of above the fray of picking sides. So, that makes sense. yeah, and it's, it's uh, um, uh, but like you said, I, I think, Mr. Chairman, if, if we can invite people to speak during the for or the against session and just identify themselves as neutral, that's fine with me, so. But, uh, and I can encourage the organization that approached me about it to do it the same way. But I've got a feeling they're not gonna wanna do it because just because of the way it looks on television. If they're up with the fours, even if they say they're neutral, they're gonna be perceived as for it or against it, so. But it's such a unique circumstance. It, it may not matter, so. I would say it's certainly uh, um, going with current trends of trying to be more inclusive um, and allowing more categories of, of, uh, of the participants. That, that said, it is inconsistent with the American judicial system 
uh, in our concepts, because if you think about it, like in a court, in, a, in an adversarial system, there is no neutral party. Uh, experts have to be either for or against. Um, and so it's, from a judicial standpoint, that's kind of the way the judicial system in America works, which is inconsistent with many other countries in the world. Uh, but it is the way we're used to dealing with it. Um, that said, we can certainly talk about it again. It doesn't need to be closed off today. So what should we expect next time, Mr. Michie? So maybe we'll work it out with uh, legal and Ms. Penny, and I'll have something written up, and it'll be in the... Uh, I guess maybe items of business and, and and it'll be ready for you before the next meeting so that way you can look over it and potentially vote on it or vote on it with conditional changes and we'll make the changes and get it uploaded back to the internet. Wonderful, thank you. Um, any other items of business? I had one last item, if, if we could. I'd like for Rebecca Dome to introduce a new employee. We'll continue the theme of trees today, if she would. Um, as part of the uh, Green Ribbon Committee process and the, the now Livable Nashville process, um, one of the real needs identified for Nashville is a strong urban forestry presence, which we, we don't currently have. So um, Bloomberg, out of, out of New York City, um, has, has been working with the mayor's office to try to implement some of the livable Nashville goals. And, and one of those goals, urban forestry, they decided that the, the, the first step would be to empower Metro Water Services to hire an urban forestry program manager to kind of manage all the silos within in, in Nashville and also coordinate um, with the nonprofits to, to grow our urban canopy and also work, you know, with street trees and things like that. And, and stormwater was a great place to, to put it because of, of the mitigative um, factors that, that trees provide for stormwater runoff. So it took a little while, but we were um, finally able to um, bring somebody in. This is her first week. I'd like to introduce uh, Naomi Rochamel. Did I do that right? All right. And um, she is going to be the Urban Forestry Program Manager and working closely with, with parks and planning and public works. Wonderful. Thank you and welcome. That said, looks like no other new items of business. I can hear a motion. I move, adjourn. We adjourn. <laughs> I'll second her. <laughs> Got a motion in a bunch of seconds. Let's hear a vote on the adjournment. Say aye. 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 In opposition to the adjournment, seeing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>